Hey, you found us. Welcome, everybody. This is Scripture Gems. Hello, and welcome to the show. My name is John Fulmer, and this is my brother Jay. How's it going, John? We are two brothers who just can't get enough of the Scriptures. Yeah, we love them. This episode, we are going over the Come Follow Me lesson for June 20th through 26th, 2022, this is covering 2 Samuel 5 through 7, 11 through 12, and 1 Kings 3, 8, and 11. And now let's bring out the star of the show, the Scriptures. Oh, Scriptures, I'm so excited to read. There's so many of you today. <laughs> yeah, I'll say. And now let's consult the Scripturematic 6000 to find out how long it will take to read this week's reading. 52 minutes, 18 seconds. Wow, this is really one of the long ones. But what would it be daily? 7 minutes, 28 seconds. Which, again, so doable. And for those who have been diligently watching the Scripturematic 6000, you might recognize that this is the same amount of time as it took you to read the judge's assignment. Now, if you want to read all of 2 Samuel, plus the first 11 chapters of 1 Kings, and we think you should, that will take you 3 hours, 34 minutes, 22 seconds, or daily, 30 minutes, 37 seconds. Half an hour a day, you can do it. Yeah, that's great. And there's a lot you can see in the chapters. There's some we're going to cover, but there's a lot we're missing. Now, on the show, we're going to go through and at least summarize, if not spend more time on all. You can see it here in the time codes. If you want to go to the chapters that just cover the Come Follow Me reading assignment, you can go right to those time codes. Otherwise, buckle up, and I think you'll be really excited about the things we're going to talk about today. Absolutely. So let's get to it. Second Samuel. Before the Septuagint, the Greek translation around 200 BC, Samuel was one book. Due to the length when translated from Hebrew into Greek, it had to be broken up into two scrolls. And so we have 1st and 2nd Samuel. But know that 2nd Samuel is just a continuation of 1st Samuel. The book of 2nd Samuel chronicles David's anointing and reign as king of Israel. David is remembered as the greatest king in Israel's history. Because of David's faithfulness, the Lord blessed and honored David. However, 2 Samuel illustrates that even the most righteous can fall if they are not diligent in keeping the commandments. And that's such an important lesson. So let's jump into it. Let's summarize the first four chapters of 2 Samuel. After David mourned the deaths of Saul and Jonathan, remember they died in a battle with the Philistines in the last lesson, he was anointed king of the tribe of Judah. One of Saul's sons, Ishbosheth, became king of the remaining tribes, and his forces engaged in a long war with David's forces. After David and his armies prevailed, David was anointed king over all of Israel. His forces conquered Jerusalem from the Jebusites, and that became Israel's political and religious center. So that brings us to 2 Samuel chapter 5. Let's take a look in verse 17. But when the Philistines heard that they had anointed David king over Israel, all the Philistines came up to seek David, and David heard of it, and went down to the hold. The Philistines also came and spread themselves in the valley of Rephaim. And David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go up to the Philistines? Wilt thou deliver them into mine hand? And the Lord said unto David, Go up, for I will doubtless deliver the Philistines into thine hand. And David came to Baal Perazim, and David smote them there, and said, The Lord hath broken forth upon mine enemies before me, as the breach of waters. Therefore he called the name of the place Baal Perazim. And there they left their images, here speaking that the Philistines left their idols. And David and his men burned them. Now this is an important feature of these wars. Like in Second Samuel chapter 2, verse 1, David inquires of the Lord and then does what the Lord commands. It reminds me of how Saul's son Jonathan wouldn't go up against the Philistine army unless he was sure God was with him, like we talked about in 1 Samuel 14. Mm -hmm. Let's go back to the chapter in verse 22. And the Philistines came up yet again and spread themselves in the valley of Rephaim. And when David inquired of the Lord, he said, Thou shalt not go up, but fetch a compass behind them which means to go around them, and come upon them over against the mulberry trees. And let it be, when thou hearest the sound of a going in the tops of the mulberry trees, 
that then thou shalt bestir thyself, for then shall the Lord go out before thee to smite the host of the Philistines. And David did so, as the Lord commanded him, and smote the Philistines from Geba until thou come to Gezer. Again, David inquired of the Lord about what he should do and then acted on the direction he received. David inquired, verses 19 and 23, and David did so as the Lord commanded him in verse 25. Yeah, I love that. And I love, too, I don't know exactly what the strategy was here about how the Lord wanted them to do it, but I love that there were mulberry trees there because then you could snack while you're waiting to attack. I just think that's... That's right. It keeps their strength up. (laughs) Let's move on then to 2 Samuel chapter 6. Now that David has his capital in Jerusalem, it was time to send for the Ark of the Covenant. It had been in the house of Abinadab in Kirjath-Jerim since it was recovered from the Philistines 20 years before. We talked about this last time in 1 Samuel 5-7. through The version of this account in 1 Chronicles 13 shows that David gathered everyone from around the kingdom to be a part of this action, centering and uniting themselves around bringing the presence of the Lord to the capital. Let's pick it up in chapter 6, verse 3. And they set the ark of God upon a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab that was in Gibeah. And Uzzah and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, drave the new cart. And they brought it out of the house of Abinadab that was in Gibeah, accompanying the ark of God. And Ahio went before the ark. And David and all the house of Israel played before the Lord on all manner of instruments made of fir wood, even on harps and on psalteries and on timbrels and on cornets and on cymbals. And when they came to Nacon's threshing floor, Uzzah put forth his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen shook it. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and God smote him there for his error. And there he died by the ark of God. Hmm. Now that may seem particularly harsh. Let's take a look at what the Institute Manual has to tell us about this incident. The Ark of the Covenant was a sacred vessel that housed some of the holiest objects in Israel's history. To touch the Ark or its contents was strictly forbidden by the Lord. Only authorized Levites, and they only under certain specified conditions, could handle the sacred instruments. Uzzah may have exhibited some bold presumption when he sought to touch that which God had forbidden to be touched. Even if Uzzah's intention was simply to keep the ark from falling, it should be remembered that God was fully capable of steadying his own ark had he wished to do so. While much of the story is not known, it is an excellent example that the commands of God are sacred and must be observed precisely as the Lord decreed. Right. The seminary manual includes a quote from Elder Neil A. Maxwell from his book, Meek and Lowly. It says, Some may reason that Uzzah was only trying, though mistakenly, to help out. But given the numerous times the Lord had saved and spared Israel, including the high dramas of the Red Sea and of the manna from heaven, surely he, the Lord, knew how to keep the ark in balance. Right. There's a great quote that's included in both the Institute Manual and the Seminary Manual. This is from David O. McKay from an April 1936 General Conference. He says, quote, It is a little dangerous for us to go out of our own sphere and try unauthoritatively to direct the efforts of a brother. You remember the case of Uzzah who stretched forth his hand to steady the ark? He seemed justified when the oxen stumbled in putting forth his hand to steady that symbol of the covenant. Today we think his punishment was very severe. Be that as it may, the incident conveys a lesson of life. Let us look around us and see how quickly men who attempt unauthoritatively to steady the ark die spiritually. Their souls become embittered, their minds distorted, their judgment faulty, and their spirit depressed. Such is the pitiable condition of men who, neglecting their own responsibilities, spend their time in finding fault with others, end quote. Right. And on that end, have we ever felt the need to correct a decision that was made by a bishop, a stake president, or maybe even the president of the church? I'll paraphrase a favorite quote of mine attributed to Elder J. Golden Kimball. If the Lord can't take care of his own church, 
then what can I do? This doesn't mean that we can't offer assistance or counsel, but we should always understand that the decisions made by those who have been called supersede our own perceived wisdom. Those called in positions of leadership at any level are doing their best to do the will of the Lord. We need to sustain them in their efforts. It's dangerous to assume we know better. Right. How much more help can we give to the Lord's kingdom than rather than complaining and finding fault, we lift and support? Are we doing all we can do before we start criticizing or questioning those in leadership positions? So in 2 Samuel 6, the rest of the chapter, after this incident, David brought the ark into Jerusalem amid great joy and celebration. David's wife, Michael, criticized David's dancing and joyous behavior, which had a negative effect on their relationship. And that brings us to 2 Samuel chapter 7, starting in verse 1. And it came to pass when the king sat in his house, and the Lord had given him rest round about from all his enemies, that the king said unto Nathan the prophet, See now, I dwell in an house of cedar, but the ark of God dwelleth within curtains. And Nathan said to the king, Go. Do all that is in thine heart, for the Lord is with thee. But later that night the Lord gave Nathan instructions. Verse 5, Go and tell my servant David, Thus saith the Lord, Shalt thou build me an house for me to dwell in? Skipping to verse 12, And when thy days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build an house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. So the Lord told the prophet Nathan that David should not build a temple. However, the Lord said he would establish David's house, his throne and kingdom forever, like it says in verses 13 and 16. He also said that one of David's descendants would build the temple. We learn later that this would be his son Solomon. Although no reason is given here as to the restriction on David to build the temple, in the account as it's recorded in 1 Chronicles 22, David told Solomon that it was revealed to him that he had seen too much war and bloodshed to build the house of the Lord. Finishing up chapter 7, David expressed his heartfelt awe and gratitude that the Lord would bless him so greatly. Now in 2 Samuel chapters 8, 9, and 10, The Lord blessed and preserved David as he reigned in righteousness. David also honored the covenant that he had made with Jonathan. He received Jonathan's son, Mephibosheth, into his home and gave him all the inheritance belonging to the house of Saul. Mephibosheth, said the king in verse 12, he shall eat at my table as one of the king's sons. Right. In 2 Samuel chapter 10, it introduces the first mention of David's mighty men in verse 7. 2 Samuel 23.39 counts only 37 to have that title. These were the elite soldiers in David's forces, the best of the best, and chief among the captains. 2 Samuel 23 and 1 Chronicles 12 give their names and some of the amazing deeds they performed. The Institute Manual says... The exploits recorded here were probably taken from various times in David's life and placed together at this point. So let's take a look at some incredible features that describe these elite men. We'll take these from 1 Chronicles chapter 12. Verse 2 says they were armed with bows and could use both the right hand and the left hand in hurling stones and shooting arrows out of a bow. In verse 8, They were men fit for the battle that could handle shield and buckler, whose faces were like the faces of lions and were as swift as the rose upon the mountains. Yeah, faces of lions mean that they don't show any fear. And of course, rows are deer upon the mountain. In verse 32, it says, They were men that had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. That's such an interesting description that they were aware of political situations, social situations, they were well informed about what was going on in the world. In verse 33, they were men which could keep rank. They were not of double heart. That idea of a double heart, 
think about how troubling it could be if we try to have one foot in the world and one foot with the Lord, God and mammon. These guys were single focused on doing good. In verse 38, it says, all these men of war that could keep rank came with a perfect heart to Hebron to make David king over all Israel. And all the rest of Israel were of one heart to make David king. That notion that they had a perfect heart, meaning that they had that singular focus to do the will of the Lord and make David king. Those are great characteristics. There was a talk given by Elder Monty J. Broff of the 70 in the October 1993 General Conference. This talk was the first time I'd ever learned about the mighty men. The talk is called the modern mighty of Israel. And it had a real impact on me in even wanting to know more about David and this time period. He tells a great account from the adventures of the mighty men in 2 Samuel 23 or 1 Chronicles 11. I'll read what he wrote. Quote, One inspiring account tells of three of these mighty men who overheard King David long for a drink of water from the well in Bethlehem, which at this time of war was controlled by the Philistines. Apparently in Bethlehem at that time was a well of particularly refreshing water of which the king wished for a drink. The king did not place a demand or order for the water. He simply expressed a desire for a taste of the cool, refreshing liquid from the Bethlehem well. Without command or assignment or even duty, three of the mighty men broke through enemy lines at great personal risk to travel to Bethlehem. They drew water out of the well and returned again at great risk through the enemy lines to bring the wonderful refreshment of Bethlehem water to David. David was so overcome by this demonstrated act of personal, unsolicited service that he refused to drink the water. He considered the act so brave and wonderful that he poured the water upon the ground. The scripture says, he poured it out unto the Lord. Close quote. This, by the way, is an interesting action. Drink offerings are mentioned in Genesis and Numbers, but use wine. The specific use of water is only found one other time in the Old Testament, and that is by Samuel in 1 Samuel chapter 7, verse 6. In that setting, he poured out water to the Lord as a declaration of self-denial as part of a fast for Israel to be forgiven of their sins. Perhaps David's action is a dedication of the water to God as part of repentance and humility. But if so, why? Perhaps David was sorry to have been so cavalier with his words, forgetting the power they carry and the responsibility he's been given. Men's lives are in his hands. Perhaps David recognizes that he is not worthy of such devotion and so offers this drink, now made sacred by the love and sacrifice of others to attain it, to the Lord. When looking at the names of the elite mighty men in 2 Samuel chapter 23, Notice two names in particular, Eliam the Gilonite and Uriah the Hittite. Those names will be important in the next chapter. Right you are. And that brings us to 2 Samuel chapter 11. Now, I wish we could keep going down this happy path, but we have to get to chapter 11. Look for clues that can help us see how David veered off his righteous path in his choices around Bathsheba and her husband Uriah. The books of Samuel, Kings, and Chronicles are all historical traditions, but they are separate traditions. Whoever their authors were, and whatever their sources were, they are each telling their own story. For example, Chronicles, which covers this same time period, does not include the story of Bathsheba and Uriah. It is only found in this account in Samuel. The New Oxford Annotated Bible offers this commentary. It says, quote, This story is artfully narrated. The writer leaves no doubt that David was in the wrong, but leaves the motives of the other characters unexplained, so that the reader may suspect but cannot know for certain what each of the characters knows or when they know it, unquote. I think this is important to understand going into this story because scholars and readers have a lot of opinions about what is happening here. And these opinions can be very passionate. Please be open to what we know 
and what we don't know in this story, because the emphasis of the author will help us to better understand what his intention was. So let's start in 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 1. And it came to pass, after the year was expired, at the time when kings go forth to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him, and all Israel. And they destroyed the children of Ammon, and besieged Rabbah. But David tarried still at Jerusalem. So here we have problem number one. It was a time when kings went out to war. Why wasn't King David out to war, if that was what was expected. Why did he tarry in Jerusalem? Good question. Verse 2, And it came to pass in an evening tide that David arose from off his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman washing herself, and the woman was very beautiful to look upon. So the time of day here is a little uncertain. Some translate the Hebrew as evening, such as here in the King James Version, and others like the NIV. Some as late afternoon. One example is the English Standard Version. And some translate it as afternoon, such as the prestigious Douay Reims Bible. But most say evening, so we'll just stick with the King James Version on that. When he saw this woman washing herself, we don't know what he is seeing. How is she illuminated if it's evening? Is she unclothed? In a washing robe? Is it her hair, her figure, or her face he finds beautiful? Probably not her face since he doesn't recognize her. Do you see what I mean, though? There's a lot we don't know here, and we might miss the point if we speculate too much. This part of the story is challenging. Many people have passionate views about this story and who's to blame. David shouldn't have been looking. The woman shouldn't have been immodest in such a public setting. But the author is focusing the intent of the story on the bad decisions David is making and where they lead. This does not mean that the woman is innocent or guilty. It is not relevant to the story the author is telling. But let's look inward for a moment. Do we ever find ourselves in situations where we might be looking at things we shouldn't be looking at? And don't look outward. It's easy to think of others and what their problems are. The parallel with pornography is obvious. But if that isn't your snare, Sister Linda S. Reeves offered the reminder of other tools of Satan that can influence us to be where we shouldn't be and looking at what we shouldn't. She says, quote, What are some of Satan's tools? Seductive romance novels? TV soap operas? Married women and old boyfriends connecting on social media? End quote. This comes from the October 2015 General Conference. Great line. These and other snares can take the mind where it shouldn't go, if we wish to remain holy. Going back to the chapter, verse 3. And David sent and inquired after the woman. And one said, Is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Well, that should be the end of it right there. It doesn't matter who she is, she is married. Remember how Abraham in his wildest dreams never imagined the Egyptians would take his wife without killing him first. And he was right. When Pharaoh found out Sarai was married, he immediately gave her back, as we talked about in Genesis chapter 12. That thing, adultery, is just not done. That's the worst of the worst. Yeah, and how does he not know her? This is not a big city, and she must live close to the palace for him to observe her. And her dad and husband are two of his elite mighty men. Eliam, Bathsheba's dad, also appears to be the son of Ahithophel, David's advisor. There's some evidence of that in 2 Samuel 23 and also chapters 16 through 17. So something is strange here. But to move forward with his intentions is to violate not just the loyalties of marriage, but of the trust of at least three others who had been with him since his outlaw days when Saul tried continuously to destroy him. What would have happened if he just turned around? What would have happened if he responded like in this cartoon? Bathsheba, huh? Well, tell her to bathe somewhere else. But instead, verse 4, And David sent messengers and took her, And she came in unto him, and he lay with her, for she was purified from her uncleanness. And she returned unto her house. 
There's no evidence to suggest that the washing that was happening on the roof was for ceremonial purposes, as some people claim. It was just a washing. Leviticus 15 indicates that ceremonial cleansings are done during the day and that the Bible does not link washing with menstrual impurity, only time, seven days from the start of a woman's period, to be clean. No washing required. Tikva Frimer Kensky in her book, Reading the Women of the Bible, tells us, Later rabbinical tradition will require women to immerse in a ritual pool, but that's not the tradition at this time. The reason for noting that she was, quote, purified from her uncleanness, unquote, is that she had just become ceremonially clean after the seven-day period of monthly impurity due to menstruation. You can learn more about that in Leviticus 15, 19 through 30. This mention makes it clear to the readers that she was not already pregnant by her own husband when David slept with her. Another possibility is that this purification is a reference to Leviticus 15, this time verse 18. Quote, the woman also with whom man shall lie with seed of copulation, you gotta love the King James Version, seed of copulation, they shall both bathe themselves in water and be unclean until the even. Close quote. A further quote from Professor Tikva Primer Kensky's book, Reading the Women of the Bible, tells us, quote, when Bathsheba purifies herself, she is washing off the impurity that comes with all sexual relations, even licit ones. In our verse, the phrase does not refer back to the bath that she was taking when she was introduced, but to post-coital purification. The verb form, present participle, also implies the sequential arrangement. Having purified herself, she returned home. Of course, the use of the term purification is another ironic element in the author's narration. She can purify herself from the ordinary pollution of sexual intercourse, but the defilement of illicit sexuality is not so easily washed off. The mention of Bathsheba's purification, like the verbs that precede it, underline the unhurried, non-secretive nature of this affair. There is no rush here. David does not send her away abruptly after he has satisfied himself, and she does not hurry off. If Levitical law can be taken as a guide for action in David's time, they may even have waited until evening. Their affair was deliberate, measured, slow, and obvious. And most likely, David didn't give it another thought. End quote. Until, verse 5, and the woman conceived and sent and told David, and said, I am with child. Pregnancy changes everything. Wow. Let's take a look at the story so far from an Eastern cultural perspective. In their book, Misreading Scripture with Western Eyes, the authors make the case that this story is a great example of the Eastern shame-honor culture. Remember that the ancient scriptures were written from an Eastern cultural perspective, not a Western. For a great overview of the differences between them, check out Hebrew Manners and Customs in the May 1972 Enzyme. It's an article by Professor Sidney B. Sperry. We'll put a link to it in the description. One clear example of the honor-shame perspective is that a servant should not know more than his master. So when the king asks who this woman is, if the servant said, Bathsheba, the king would be shamed. Instead, the servant gives the information in the form of a question. Is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Now David can say, yes, that is correct, and save face. As indicated already, this was not a private affair. Servants had been involved. News would have spread quickly. What happens next is a battle between honor and shame between David and the husband Uriah. Remember that the affair is public. The pregnancy is public. Remember, it says she sent and told David. And it is public that David sent for the husband. Quoting from the book, Misreading Scripture with Western Eyes, it says, quote, David is asking Uriah to let him off the hook. If Uriah comes home and spends one night with his wife, then the baby is, quote-unquote, technically Uriah's, even though everyone knows otherwise. Honor would be restored among the men. 
We should note David's concern is not whether adultery is objectively right or wrong. He doesn't appear to be nursing a guilty conscience. While in our Western culture, a guilty conscience can go without being said, in David's culture, honor and shame did not need to be stated overtly. The hints and innuendos were sufficient. David's concern was not soothing a guilty conscience, but protecting his honor as king. Close quote. And so let's look at how he tries to do that. Verse 6, And David sent to Joab, saying, Send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. And when Uriah was come unto him, David demanded of him how Joab did, and how the people did, and how the war prospered. And David said to Uriah, Go down to thy house, and wash thy feet. And Uriah departed out of the king's house, and there followed him a mess of meat from the king. Now, with all the gossip, There is no way Uriah does not know what is going on. Even with all the kindness and gifts from David, Uriah is not going to play ball. He will not restore David's honor. Verse 9, But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his lord, and went not down to his house. So this was a public display that he was not letting David off the hook. Everyone saw it, and they told David. Verse 10, And when they told David, saying, Uriah went not down unto his house, David said unto Uriah, Camest thou not from thy journey? Why then didst thou not go down unto thine house? And Uriah said unto David, The ark and Israel and Judah abide in tents, and my lord Joab and the servants of my lord are encamped in the open fields. Shall I then go into mine house to eat and to drink and to lie with my wife? As thou livest, and as thy soul liveth, I will not do this thing. This second audience with the king is a veiled threat, but Uriah is angry. Quoting again from Misreading Scripture with Western Eyes, quote, His response shames David in three ways. First, Uriah notes that everyone, with one exception, was where they were supposed to be in the field with the army. The ark and Israel and Judah are staying in tents. Even God, symbolized by the ark, was there. Everyone was there, that is, but David. Second, Uriah notes the one in the field commanding the army, doing David's job, was Joab, not David. This was all the more poignant because Uriah was a paid soldier, a Hittite mercenary. He had less reason to fight for Israel than David had. Lastly, Uriah indicates to David he knows exactly what David wants for him to lie with his wife and will not cooperate. Close quote. In verse 12, And David said to Uriah, Tarry here today also, and tomorrow I will let thee depart. So Uriah abode in Jerusalem that day and the morrow. And when David had called him, he did eat and drink before him, and he made him drunk. And at even he went out to lie on his bed with the servants of his Lord, but went not down to his house. Even getting him drunk so he wouldn't make good decisions or maybe even have him pass out so he could have his servants toss him into his house, none of that worked. Uriah made it clear to everyone, including David, that he will not give David an honorable way out of this mess. Going on in verse 14, And it came to pass in the morning that David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. And he wrote in the letter, saying, Set ye Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle, and retire ye from him, that he may be smitten and die. And it came to pass, when Joab observed the city, that he assigned Uriah unto a place where he knew that valiant men were. And the men of the city went out and fought with Joab, and there fell some of the people of the servants of David. And Uriah the Hittite died also. So this is a class act move on the part of David. Not only does he arrange for Uriah's death in a very sneaky and underhanded way, he sends the order by Uriah. Yeah. Uriah's carrying his own death sentence. I suspect he knew that he was carrying his own death sentence. Well, perhaps. I don't think there's any surprise of what he thought was going to happen. 
Well, David is not torn up about this. He may have felt Uriah deserved it. After all, he had given him every opportunity to resolve the situation honorably, and he wouldn't play ball. So in verses 18 to 25, Joab didn't quite follow David's instructions, but the outcome was the same. Instead of pulling his men back, other than Uriah, from the hottest battle, he engaged in a battle which was strategically not smart. They attacked a walled or fortified city directly. This unfortunately resulted in the deaths of many other soldiers, not just Uriah. Footnote 20a might be helpful in clarifying this. When a messenger reported these deaths, including Uriah, David replied with indifference, saying, The sword devoureth one as well as another, and encouraged his army to continue in battle. Wow. Let's pick it up in verse 26. And when the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead, she mourned for her husband. And when the morning was past, David sent and fetched her to his house, and she became his wife, and bare him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. So according to the cultural standards of his day, there was no further recourse. All parties were satisfied or silenced. According to the honor-shame system of David's day, the matter was resolved. Quoting again from Misreading Scripture with Western Eyes, quote, Although David had acted appropriately according to the broader cultural standards of his day, God held him to higher moral standards. Even so, God worked through the honor-shame system to bring David to repentance. The culture of David's day didn't have a way to bring up the matter. We Westerners might assume that God's Spirit would eventually convict David's inner heart. That's because Westerners are introspective. We respond to internal pressure. But David doesn't appear to be experiencing any inner pressure. No matter. God is not stymied by culture. God had introduced another element into ancient Near Eastern culture, a prophet. Instead of a voice whispering to his heart, a prophet shouted at his face. Either way, God speaks. Since David's culture used shame to bring about conformity, God used shame to bring David to repentance. Close quote. And let's take a look at this. This is one of the great parables in all of Scripture. 2 Samuel chapter 12, starting in verse 1. And the Lord sent Nathan unto David, and he came unto him and said unto him, There were two men in one city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had exceeding many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing, save one little ewe lamb, which he had bought and nourished up. And it grew up together with him and with his children. It did eat of his own meat and drink of his own cup and lay in his bosom and was unto him as a daughter. And there came a traveler unto the rich man, and he spared to take of his own flock and of his own herd to dress for the wayfaring man that was come unto him, but took the poor man's lamb, and dressed it for the man that was come to him. And David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. And he said to Nathan, As the Lord liveth, the man that has done this thing shall surely die. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold, because he did this thing, and because he had no pity. And Nathan said to David, Thou art the man. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I anointed thee king over Israel, and I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul. And I gave thee thy master's house and thy master's wives into thy bosom and gave thee the house of Israel and of Judah. And if that had been too little, I would moreover have given unto thee such and such things. Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword and hast taken his wife to be thy wife and hast slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. Going on in verse 10. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from thine house, because thou hast despised me, and hast taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against thee out of thine own house, and I will take thy wives before thine eyes, and give them unto thy neighbor, and he shall lie with thy wives in the sight of this son. For thou didst it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the sun. And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, 
The Lord also hath put away thy sin. Thou shalt not die, howbeit because by this deed thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. The child also that is born unto thee shall surely die. Now this parable had to have stung. Oh, yeah. Let me tell you a story about a guy who did something horrible. Oh, and it's you. Yeah. Well, notice, too, the indication that of all the other commandments David has broken, thou shalt not covet, don't commit adultery, or bear false witness, or murder. He has also taken the name of the Lord in vain by doing all this while representing God before the nations, as it talks about in verse 14. Others would have great occasion to despise God because of what David did. The Institute Manual gives us a little bit more insight about Nathan's prophecy that their coming child will die. It says, quote, The child born of David and Bathsheba's illicit union did not live, but there is no reason to look upon that as punishment of the child for the sins of the parents. Removal from this earth by the hand of the Lord must come at one time or another, and can be a blessing for an individual brought about for his best interest at whatever time the Lord sees to be optimum, end quote. From the seminary manual, it has a quote from Elder Richard G. Scott. This is from an October 2013 general conference. He says, It is a fundamental truth that through the atonement of Jesus Christ, we can be cleansed. We can become virtuous and pure. However, sometimes our poor choices leave us with long-term consequences. One of the vital steps to complete repentance is, is to bear the short and long-term consequences of our past sins. Mm -hmm. Notice also that phrase in verse 13, The Lord also hath put away thy sin. Check footnote 13b. The idea is that David will not be punished by death, but he has not escaped punishment. In fact, the Joseph Smith translation for this verse, which is not included in our edition of the Scriptures, by the way, reads, The Lord also hath not put away thy sin. So, in the remaining verses of 2 Samuel 12, the child born to David and Bathsheba died, as Nathan prophesied. David and Bathsheba had another son, whom they named Solomon. And he will play a very important role as we go forward. Right. Now, this is where the Come, Follow Me reading ends for 2 Samuel. But we're going to summarize the rest of the book. 2 Samuel chapters 13 through 18 describe tragic events involving two of King David's sons, Amnon and Absalom. These chapters also show the fulfillment of the prophesied consequences of David's sins. In 2 Samuel chapter 13, David's son Amnon acted on his lustful feelings for his half-sister Tamar and sexually assaulted her. These verses are really hard to read. It's heart-wrenching what happens. Just a heads up. After satisfying his lustful desires, Amnon despised Tamar and sent her away. Her future was now ruined. Her brother Absalom was furious. David, too, was angry because of Amnon's wicked actions, but he did nothing. Can you imagine that? Her own father? I know. It's terrible. It seems like he didn't feel he had any moral ground to stand on. I can't imagine him being idle in the face of this awful abuse if he had still been on his righteous path. Yeah. Because David would not avenge Tamar, Absalom waited two years, then deceived King David into letting all of the king's sons, including Amnon, travel to a place called Baal Hazor to help shear Absalom's sheep. Let's pick it up in verse 28 of chapter 13. Now Absalom had commanded his servants, saying, Mark ye now when Amnon's heart is merry with wine, and when I say unto you, Smite Amnon, then kill him. Fear not, have not I commanded you? Be courageous and valiant. And the servants of Absalom did unto Amnon, as Absalom had commanded. Then all the king's sons arose, and every man gat him up upon his mule and fled. I can't imagine how hard it would have been to let this incident go. Maybe Absalom felt that he had exhausted all other options, but the story reads like he held on to his anger and resentment and plotted to destroy Amnon rather than looking for other outlets for justice. Note too in verse 29 how all the king's sons ride mules. 
Apparently, during this time in David's reign, mules were the royal steed. So if this is true, if Absalom really did let all the anger and resentment kind of stew over this last two years, this quote might be helpful for us today. Quoted from the seminary manual, this quote from Lynn G. Robbins from the April 1998 General Conference says this, quote, A cunning part of Satan's strategy is to dissociate anger from agency, making us believe that we are victims of an emotion that we cannot control. We hear, I lost my temper. Losing one's temper is an interesting choice of words that has become a widely used idiom. To lose something implies not meaning to, accidental, involuntary, not responsible, careless, perhaps, but not responsible. He made me mad. This is another phrase we hear, also implying lack of control or agency. This is a myth that must be debunked. No one makes us mad. Others don't make us angry. There is no force involved. Becoming angry is a conscious choice, a decision. Therefore, we can make the choice not to become angry. We choose. To those who say, but I can't help myself, author William Wilbanks responds, nonsense. Aggression, suppressing the anger, talking about it, screaming and yelling are all learned strategies in dealing with anger. We choose the one that has proved effective for us in the past. Ever notice how seldom we lose control when frustrated by our boss, but how often we do when annoyed by friends or family? Close quote. It's a great line. I love that. Moving on to 2 Samuel chapter 14. After Absalom had Amnon killed, he escaped justice by running away and seeking protection from his grandfather, Talmai, the king of Geshur. After three years, Joab, David's captain, used a woman to help David realize his error in banishing Absalom. Joab had her do what Nathan did and weave a story pretending it was true. This would help David see his own error. Then David allowed him to return to Jerusalem. Chapter 14 gives us some additional insights to Absalom's complicated character. First off, he was shockingly handsome, as it says in verse 25, But in all Israel there was none to be so much praised as Absalom for his beauty. For the sole of his foot, even to the crown of his head, there was no blemish in him. And when he polled his head, that means gave him a haircut, for it was at every year's end that he polled it, because the hair was heavy on him, therefore he polled it. He weighed the hair of his head at 200 shekels after the king's weight. Now, quick aside, 200 shekels, that's about five pounds. That's a lot of hair. That's a lot of hair. Luxurious. And unto Absalom, there were born three sons and one daughter, whose name was Tamar. She was a woman of a fair countenance. So it looks like he named his daughter after his sister whom he had avenged. That shows a tender heart, I think. However, when he is finally brought back to Jerusalem, he waits two years and still is not granted an audience with his father. So he finally sends for Joab, the king's captain, to set up an audience with the king. Twice he sends for Joab and he doesn't come. So what does he do? Simple. He sends servants to set fire to Joab's barley field. <laughs> I guess that would get his attention. (laughs) So Joab arrives in quick order and says, Wherefore have thy servants set my field on fire? Absalom says essentially, Oh good, you're here. Now you brought me back home when I was perfectly happy in Gesher. Quote, Now therefore, let me see the king's face. And if there be any iniquity in me, let him kill me. That's in verse 32. Joab makes the arrangements and Absalom appears before his father David, who forgives him. Let's summarize 2 Samuel 15 through 18. After Absalom's return to Jerusalem, he begins conspiring to overthrow King David and eventually succeeded in driving him and the rest of his family and supporters out of Jerusalem. The two sides began a violent struggle for the kingdom. During the battle between Absalom's supporters and King David's men, Absalom fled on his mule. Remember the royal mounts of David's kingdom. And he became entangled in a tree by his luxurious hair as he tried to flee. 
what happened is the mule went underneath this oak tree and his hair appears to have gotten caught in the branches. And then the mule went on and he was left hanging there. Take a look at verse 9. When Joab, the captain of King David's army, found Absalom hanging there, he killed him. Absalom's handsome head and incredible hair was in the end his undoing. You could say that the source of his pride was the cause of his downfall. Now, that would never happen to Jay and I. Oh, no. So use this story of Absalom as a cautionary tale for those of you beautiful people out there with amazing hair. Yeah, watch out. (laughs) Now, this incident with Absalom is realistic. If any of you have any experience with ponies or horses, when I was a kid, I had a Palomino pony. And I will tell you, that horse pony, its favorite thing in the world was to find a tree with low-hanging branches and try to go under it to knock me off. So I wasn't surprised at all at reading this story of Absalom. I could even see the mule's expression of delight. (laughs) But it's also highly symbolic. The mule is the royal mount. Absalom is unseated, symbolizing the loss of his kingdom. So when King David heard about this, let's take a look in verse 33. And the king was much moved, and went up to the chamber over the gate, and wept. And as he went, thus he said, O my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, would God I had died for thee, O Absalom, my son, my son. How do you think things might have been different if David had made more righteous choices? This might be an interesting thing to discuss with family and friends. Look back over what happened since the Bathsheba incident. How might things have been different? Let's summarize 2 Samuel chapters 19 through the last chapter 24. After Absalom's death, David returned to Jerusalem. Another rebellion among the tribes of Israel was quickly put down by Joab, who led David's army. Israel suffered a famine that lasted three years. King David displeased the Lord by counting the number of men in Judah and Israel who could serve in the military. The scriptures do not explain why this numbering of the people was offensive, but it might have been representative of David's trust in the strength of his army rather than in the power of God. At the very least, check footnote 1a for chapter 24. The implication is that Satan inspired David to perform this numbering. 1 Chronicles 21, verse 1, makes that idea much clearer. Also note chapter 24, verse 16. Anytime you see a verse in the Old Testament that states that the Lord repents, expect to find a Joseph Smith translation correction. Here, this verse should read, The Lord said unto him, Stay now thine hand, it is enough, for the people repented. And the Lord stayed the hand of the angel, that he destroyed not the people. Finally, to save the people from a plague, David offered sacrifices to the Lord. And that brings us to 1 Kings. Wow. The book of 1 Kings describes the height of the Israelite kingdom under Solomon. Yay! And unfortunately, its decline, also under Solomon. Aww. (laughs) The kingdom will fracture into two nations, Israel in the north and Judah in the south. The book of Kings was a single book in Hebrew, but split into two when translated into Greek. You'd be amazed at how much longer a text is when you add vowels and word breaks. Right. So, 1 Kings chapter 1 introduces us to a very important person. Have you ever felt cold and you just couldn't get warm, even with lots of blankets? That was the problem with an aging King David. The solution? was a young woman named Abishag. It was her job to warm the king. Now, verse 4 tells us there was no funny business going on between them. She cherished the king and ministered to him in verse 4. But it seems her main job was to keep him warm. I hope you don't mind if I get personal for a minute. I relate to that story because my wife calls me her Abishag. Yes, she is often cold, and I apparently am a very effective human radiator. Right. Yes, I'm a bit of a furnace myself. Must be genetic. In fact, whenever I'm traveling for work, this is my wife's number one complaint. 
I'm not there to keep her warm. Yep. Here is to all the Abishags out there. We hear you. That's right. Now, in chapter 1, verses 5 through 10, as David is nearing the end of his life, Adonijah, another of David's sons, makes an aggressive claim for the throne, pulling together support from the military and religious leaders. Adonijah was David's fourth son, but David's first and third sons, Amnon and Absalom, were already dead. The second son, Chiliab, is not mentioned is not mentioned in Samuel or Kings other than the fact that he was born. There's a good possibility he's dead too at this point. David had many wives. Adonijah was born of his wife Haggith. Adonijah secures for himself some strong support, including Joab, the captain of David's armies, and Abiathar, the priest. Right. In verses 11 through 53, Nathan, the prophet, was not among Adonijah's supporters. He and Bathsheba worked together to make sure David lived up to his vow to make Solomon, his son with Bathsheba, king when he died. This is one of the various examples showing that Bathsheba is a woman who takes charge of her future and secures herself a dynasty. The role of Nathan helps us understand that this was the Lord's will, This is something even Adonijah admits in 1 Kings 2, verse 15. David follows through and Solomon is proclaimed king. Solomon is officially anointed in Gihon by Zadok the priest, verses 38 and 39 of chapter 1. This puts Adonijah in a precarious position, but Solomon declares he holds no grudges against him. But not without this warning in verse 52. And Solomon said, If he will show himself a worthy man, there shall not an hair of him fall to the earth. But if wickedness shall be found in him, he shall die. And that brings us to 1 Kings chapter 2. In the first few verses before David dies, he admonishes Solomon to be true to the Lord always. As footnote 1a tells us, you can find a poetic version of this prayer for Solomon in Psalm 72. Nice. Now, verses 11 through 46, Adonijah for reasons I cannot fathom, decides to approach Bathsheba, Solomon's mother, and ask if she will approach Solomon for him and ask for Abishag to be his wife. Perhaps he was cold. (laughs) Maybe. Abishag was never identified strictly as a concubine, but she is certainly very publicly identified with David. By marrying her, he could consummate the marriage, something his father did not do, And this certainly seems to smack of the kind of conspiracy that Solomon had warned him against in chapter 1, verse 52. This action prompts Solomon to realize that he needs to clean house of those that had not supported his kingship, which he does. Those who sought to cause division in the kingdom were either banished or put to death. One specific note about Abiathar the priest and Joab, the former captain of David's armies, They had both sided with Adonijah earlier. When Joab learned that Solomon was cleaning house, Joab ran to the altar at the tabernacle to claim sanctuary. The Institute Manual gives us this further insight. Quote, Abiathar and Joab were still conspiring to put Adonijah on the throne. Solomon banished Abiathar from Jerusalem and took from him the office of high priest in Israel. Abiathar was a great-grandson of Eli, who was both priest and judge in Israel and the last of his descendants to hold a priestly office. This punishment and restriction of Abiathar fulfilled the prophecy announced to Eli by the Lord in 1 Samuel chapter 2. Abiathar probably escaped with the punishment of exile only because Solomon was reluctant to execute a high priest. Joab, however, was a much more dangerous enemy because he had commanded the army. There was no question concerning Joab's guilt. Because of the murders he had committed, he was indeed worthy of death. Thus, he had no right to claim sanctuary of the altar, and Solomon was not obligated to honor his claim to sanctuary. End quote. So that then brings us to 1 Kings chapter 3. And we're back in the Come Follow Me reading. Here we go. The first eight verses, Solomon loved the Lord and traveled to Gibeon to offer sacrifices upon an altar. And the Lord appeared to him, and asked what blessings he desired. Wow! What would you ask for with such an invitation? Let's look in verse 9. Give therefore thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people, 
that I may discern between good and bad. For who is able to judge this thy so great a people? And the speech pleased the Lord, that Solomon had asked this thing. And God said unto him, Because thou hast asked this thing, and hast not asked for thyself long life, neither hast asked riches for thyself, nor hast asked the life of thine enemies, but hast asked for thyself understanding to discern judgment. Behold, I have done according to thy words. Lo, I have given thee a wise and an understanding heart, so that there was none like thee before thee, neither after thee shall any arise like unto thee. And I have also given thee that which thou hast not asked, both riches and honor, so that there shall not be any among the kings like unto thee all thy days. And if thou wilt walk in my ways to keep my statutes and my commandments as thy father David did walk, then I will lengthen thy days. So notice the importance of the desires of our hearts. Right. Our Heavenly Father wants to bless us, and where our desire is, is very important. That's right, and it's also a great example that the Lord will bless us for righteous desires and more also. Right. Even more than we can come up with. So notice in verse 14, why did the Lord praise David's righteousness when David had violated the law of chastity and caused Uriah's murder? The Institute Manual offers this insight. It says, quote, There are numerous places in the historical books where David is held up as an example of one who was pleasing in God's sight. The prophet Joseph Smith corrected each of those references to show that David was being used by the Lord as an example of what David's successors should not do. For example, in the Joseph Smith translation, 1 Kings 3.14 reads, And if thou wilt walk in my ways and keep my statutes and my commandments, then will I lengthen thy days, and thou shalt not walk in unrighteousness, as did thy father David. Note that, again, this Joseph Smith translation is not found in our scriptures. Not all of them are. We have just a selection because we don't have the rights to them. The reorganized church, or today known as the Community of Christ, allows us to use selected sections in our scriptures. If you're interested in more of the story behind that, we recommend That Promised Day, the coming forth of the LDS scriptures. You can watch it for free on BYU TV. This, by the way, was purposefully a tease in the hopes that you'll be motivated to check out that documentary. It's very exciting. It's really great. And we'll include that BYU TV link in the description. Right. From the seminary manual, it tells us, Modern Revelation records the Lord's words concerning David after David had Uriah killed. Therefore he hath fallen from his exaltation. That's from Doctrine and Covenants 132, verse 39. As a consequence, David is still unforgiven, but he received a promise that the Lord would not leave his soul in hell. He will be resurrected at the end of the millennium. That's from the Bible Dictionary under the article, David. So going on in chapter 3, verses 15 to 23, Solomon went to Jerusalem, worshipped the Lord, and provided a feast for all his servants. During the feast, two women petitioned King Solomon to judge a difficult circumstance. The two women lived with each other and bore children about the same time. One night, one of the women woke up to find that her baby had died. Rather than mourn the loss of her baby, she switched her dead baby with the other woman's baby. The next morning, when the second woman arose to nurse her child, she found the other woman's dead child instead of her son. The first woman fervently denied the other woman's accusation that she had switched the babies. They sought King Solomon's judgment to settle the matter. Now, this would be a very difficult situation to judge. How would you know who was telling the truth? Remember, this was a few thousand years before DNA tests. Uh, right. So, let's find out how the very wise King Solomon handles the situation, starting in verse 24. And the king said, Bring me a sword. And they brought a sword before the king. And the king said, Divide the living child in two, and give half to the one and half to the other. Well, now that seems fair. Yeah, I I guess. (laughs) Let's see what happens in verse 26. Then spake the woman whose the living child was unto the king, for her bowels yearned upon her son. And she said, O my lord, give her the living child, and in no wise slay it. But the other said, Let it be neither mine nor thine, but divide it. Then the king answered and said, Give her the living child. 
and in no wise slay it, she is the mother thereof. And all Israel heard of the judgment which the king had judged. And they feared the king, for they saw that the wisdom of God was in him to do judgment. Now the Institute Manual offers this insight. Solomon's prayer for an understanding heart in 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 9 was surely granted, as the incident of the two harlots demonstrates. The brilliance of Solomon's strategy is seen when one reflects that the woman who was willing to give up the baby rather than see it killed would be the best mother to the child, whether she was the natural mother or not. Very interesting. This takes us to 1 Kings chapter 4. This chapter tells us that knowledge of Solomon's wisdom spread to other nations, and it describes his vast wealth and prosperity as an expression of God's blessings to Solomon and to his people. Chapters 5 through 7 describe Solomon's efforts in building the temple of the Lord. Chapter 5, verse 5, says this, And behold, I propose to build an house unto the name of the Lord my God, as the Lord spake unto David my father, saying, Thy son, whom I will set upon thy throne in thy room, he shall build an house unto my name. And the Lord covenanted with his people, as we see in verse 12. Concerning this house, which thou art in building, if thou wilt walk in my statutes, and execute my judgments, and keep all my commandments to walk in them, then will I perform my word with thee, which I spake unto David thy father, and I will dwell among the children of Israel, and will not forsake my people Israel. The seminary manual gives us this great quote from President Thomas S. Monson. This comes from the April 2011 General Conference. He says, quote, Those who understand the eternal blessings which come from the temple know that no sacrifice is too great, no price too heavy, no struggle too difficult in order to receive those blessings. Your sacrifice may be bringing your life into compliance with what is required to receive a recommend, perhaps by forsaking long-held habits which disqualify you, end quote. Now, from chapter 6, verse 14 to chapter 7, verse 51, we learn that it took approximately seven years to finish building the temple and 13 years for Solomon to finish building his palace. The Institute Manual gives this comparison between Solomon's temple and the tabernacle. This is a quote from James E. Talmadge's book, House of the Lord. He says, quote, A comparison of the plan of Solomon's temple with that of the earlier tabernacle shows that in all essential arrangement and proportion, the two were so nearly alike as to be practically identical. True, the tabernacle had but one enclosure, while the temple was surrounded by courts. But the inner structure itself, the temple proper, closely followed the earlier design. The dimensions of the Holy of Holies, the holy place, and the porch were, in the temple, exactly double of those corresponding parts in the tabernacle. End quote. So it's big. Right. Really big. Now, we've talked about this channel before, but here's another example where the Messages of Christ YouTube channel would be a really good resource. They have some videos about ancient temples, and we really recommend this one about Solomon's temple. It really helps to see what is being described. We'll include a link in the description. And that brings us to 1 Kings chapter 8. In the first 21 verses, Solomon gathered many Israelites to participate in the dedication of the temple. After they placed the Ark of the Covenant in the Holy of Holies, the glory of the Lord, it says, appeared as a cloud that filled the temple. In verses 22 through 53, we find a dedicatory prayer that Solomon offered on this occasion. After Solomon declared the goodness and the might of the Lord, verses 22 through 28, he prayed that having a temple among them would be a blessing and help the people maintain their commitment to the Lord. Let's take a look at verse 29. That thine eyes may be open toward this house night and day, even toward the place of of which thou hast said, My name shall be there, that thou mayest hearken unto the prayer which thy servant shall make toward this place. And hearken thou to the supplication of thy servant, and of thy people Israel, when they shall pray toward this place. And hear thou in heaven thy dwelling place, and when thou hearest, forgive. 
Going on, let's look for how Solomon predicts challenges for Israel and prays for blessings to help them overcome. Verse 33, When thy people Israel be smitten down before the enemy, because they have sinned against thee, and shall turn again to thee, and confess thy name, and pray, and make supplication unto thee in this house, then hear thou in heaven, and forgive the sin of thy people Israel, and bring them again unto the land which thou gavest unto their fathers. When heaven is shut up, and there is no rain, because they have sinned against thee, if they pray toward this place, and confess thy name, and turn from their sin, when thou afflictest them, then hear thou in heaven, and forgive the sin of thy servants, and of thy people Israel, that thou teach them the good way wherein they should walk, and give rain upon thy land, which thou hast given to thy people for an inheritance. If there be in the land famine, if there be pestilence, blasting, mildew, locust, or if there be caterpillar, if their enemy besiege them in the land of their cities, whatsoever plague, whatsoever sickness there be, what prayer and supplication soever be made by any man or by all thy people Israel, which shall know every man the plague of his own heart, and spread forth his hand toward this house. Then hear thou in heaven thy dwelling place, and forgive, and do, and give to every man according to his ways, whose heart thou knowest. For thou, even thou only, knowest the hearts of all the children of men, that they may fear thee all the days that they live in the land which thou gavest unto our fathers. Let's pick this prayer up in verse 46. If they sin against thee, For there is no man that sinneth not. And thou be angry with them, and deliver them to the enemy, so that they carry them away captives unto the land of the enemy, far or near. Yet if they shall bethink themselves in the land whither they were carried captives, and repent, and make supplication unto thee in the land of them that carried them captives, saying, We have sinned, and have done perversely, we have committed wickedness, and so return unto thee with all their heart and with all their soul in the land of their enemies, which led them away captive, and pray unto thee toward their land, which thou gavest unto their fathers, the city which thou hast chosen, and the house which I have built for thy name. Then hear thou their prayer and their supplication in heaven, thy dwelling place, and maintain their cause. Now in verses 50 through 66, Solomon concluded the dedicatory prayer and offered sacrifices that were accepted by the Lord. See also 2 Chronicles 7 verse 1. Now, if some of the phrases of this prayer remind you of our study of Doctrine and Covenants 109 last year, it should. Section 109 is the recorded dedicatory prayer of the Kirtland Temple and was clearly inspired by Solomon's prayer in this chapter. Nice. Let's share a quote from President Gordon B. Hinckley. This is from an Ensign article called The Salt Lake Temple in March of 1993. He says, quote, The temple is a place of personal inspiration and revelation. Legion are those who in times of stress, when difficult decisions must be made and perplexing problems must be handled, have come to the temple in a spirit of fasting and prayer to seek divine direction. Many have testified that while voices of revelation were not heard, impressions concerning a course to follow were experienced at that time, or later, which became answers to their prayers. End quote. I could say a hearty amen to that. Me too. So, going on in 1 Kings chapter 9 and chapter 10, we learn that the Lord fulfilled his promises to Solomon. Just look at the chapter headings. Chapter 9. The Lord again appears to Solomon. The Lord promises great blessings if the Israelites are obedient and great cursings if they forsake him. Solomon reigns in splendor, levies tribute upon the non-Israelites, and builds a navy of ships. In chapter 10, the chapter heading says, The queen of Sheba visits Solomon. His wealth and wisdom exceed that of all the kings of the earth. The visit of the queen of Sheba is particularly interesting. We don't know exactly where she was from, but there are several theories. She was clearly a smart cookie in her own right and came to test Solomon's legendary wisdom. In the end, it tells us, starting in verse 6, And she said to the king, It was a true report I heard in mine own land of thy acts and of thy wisdom, 
Howbeit I believed not the words until I came, and mine eyes had seen it, and behold, the half was not told me. Thy wisdom and prosperity exceedeth the fame which I heard. So that brings us to 1 Kings chapter 11. You know, there's something about chapter 11 in this book and in 2 Samuel. It's the chapter when things go wrong. Starting in verse 1. But King Solomon loved many strange women, together with the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Zidonians, and Hittites. Of the nations concerning which the Lord said unto the children of Israel, Ye shall not go into them. Neither shall they come in unto you, for surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. Solomon clave unto these in love. So Solomon loved crazy women? I don't know. (laughs) Now, yes, the seminary manual makes that clear. The phrase strange women refers to women that were not of the house of Israel. Remember that the Israelites had covenanted to serve the Lord and thereby receive his protection. Marrying within the covenant meant marrying a faithful member of the house of Israel. The many strange women Solomon married were not part of the gospel covenant and came from nations that did not worship the Lord or keep his commandments. These marriages reflected political alliances that Solomon had made with other nations. And this might suggest even a lack of faith in the Lord's protection relying on these marriage alliances for their protection instead. Interesting. In verse 3, And he had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. For it came to pass when Solomon was old that his wives turned away his heart after other gods. And his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. Now, footnote B indicates with the Joseph Smith translation that David's heart was also not perfect with the Lord. Verse 5, For Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Zidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. And Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord and went not fully after the Lord, as did David his father. Then did Solomon build an high place for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, in the hill that is before Jerusalem, and for Molech, the abomination of the children of Ammon. And likewise did he for all his strange wives, which burnt incense and sacrificed unto their gods. There are at least a couple of things to take away from this. One is that who we choose to marry has a profound influence on the decisions we make. And two, this is another example of what we've been talking about. Women were a very powerful influence. Let's continue on in verse 9. And the Lord was angry with Solomon, because his heart was turned from the Lord God of Israel, which had appeared unto him twice, and had commanded him concerning this thing, that he should not go after other gods. But he kept not that which the Lord commanded. Wherefore the Lord said unto Solomon, Forasmuch as this is done of thee, and thou hast not kept my covenant and my statutes, which I have commanded thee, I will surely rend the kingdom from thee, and will give it to thy servant. Notwithstanding, in thy days I will not do it for David thy father's sake, but I will rend it out of the hand of thy son. Howbeit I will not rend away all the kingdom, but will give one tribe to thy son for David my servant's sake, and for Jerusalem's sake, which I have chosen. You know, We've been very clear about David's sins, but when you hear things like he's going to show mercy for David's sake, you at least have to give David this. Saul started out great and then turned away from God and worshiped other gods. Solomon did the same thing. David is the only one of the three kings that even though he greatly sinned, he spent the rest of his life praising, repenting, Gathering things for the temple, he never turned to other gods. He always stayed true to the God of Israel in his worship. Very true. In verses 14 through 25, After Solomon turned his heart away from the Lord, he allowed the Israelites' enemies to afflict them. Going on in verse 26, And Jeroboam the son of Nebat, an Ephrathite of Zereda, Solomon's servant, whose mother's name was Zeruah, a widow woman, Even he lifted up his hand against the king, and this was the cause that he lifted up his hand against the king. 
Solomon built Millo and repaired the breaches of the city of David his father. And the man Jeroboam was a mighty man of valor. And Solomon, seeing the young man that he was industrious, he made him ruler over all the charge of the house of Joseph. Look at the kind of man Jeroboam was. This is the servant mentioned in verse 11 that the Lord will give the kingdom to, all except one tribe for David's sake. Interesting side note on verse 32 and 36. The Septuagint actually says two tribes, as it says in your footnotes. This is an important distinction because Benjamin, the tribe south of Judah, will remain as part of Judah after the coming divide. Right. So going on at verse 37, Ahijah the prophet visits Jeroboam and explains to him what the Lord will do. Verse 37, And I will take thee, and thou shalt reign according to all that thy soul desireth, and shalt be king over Israel. And it shall be, if thou wilt hearken unto all that I command thee, and wilt walk in my ways, and do that is right in my sight, to keep my statutes and my commandments, as David my servant did, that I will be with thee, and build thee a sure house, as I built for David, and will give Israel unto thee. So in the last few verses of chapter 11, when Solomon learned Jeroboam was a threat to his kingdom, he sought to kill Jeroboam, and Jeroboam fled to Egypt. But we'll talk more about Jeroboam next time. Right. There are big changes about to happen, and the kingdom is going to be very different after chapter 11. So thinking back on all that's happened, what stands out to you the most? What did you learn from the good examples of these righteous men and from the wicked examples of these wicked men? The fact that we all have that capacity to be very righteous and to let that testimony, that light, fail when we don't keep the commandments and statutes of the Lord. What gems may have pricked your hearts in this week's reading? Be sure to share them with your family and friends. Keep reading your scriptures. And we'll look forward to talking to you more about them in our next lesson. We'll see you then. This podcast is not officially affiliated with The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. But we're really big fans. <laughs>